Hi, it's Emma. This video is going to be about the Electoral College, which is the way we elect the President of the United States. It's not as simple as just majority rules because that is not how the Founding Fathers outlined it in the Constitution. So how does this work? Each state gets a number of electors proportionate to its population, and this is shown on the map above. The number of electors per state is equal to the number of reps in the House plus the number of senators. The candidate who gets the most votes in the general election in the state gets all of the state's electors. So when you go to the polls to vote for the president, you aren't voting directly, you're voting for your state's electors. These electors, who are actual people, come together 41 days after the popular election and cast their votes for the president. So all the electors from a certain state vote for the same candidate, whoever won the popular election in their state. You need more than, total, more than half of the total electors to win the presidency, so you need 270. If this doesn't happen and no candidate has the majority of the electoral votes, the decision goes to the House to elect the president, but this only happened once in the 1800s. So why do we have such a complex system to elect the president? This was another one of those compromises made at the Constitutional Convention. The Founding Fathers did not trust straight-up democracy because they didn't think people were informed enough to make decisions at the time, so they added an extra layer where people are represented by electors. They thought that the Electoral College would help avoid a sort of mob mentality or a tyranny of the majority. Also, political parties didn't exist back then, so the Founding Fathers figured there would be a bunch of candidates and no one would get the majority, so Congress would end up picking the president anyway, but the political system has completely evolved since then. In theory, the electors could go against the popular vote of their state, but only in about half of them since the others have laws against this. However, this is rarely done. Since the process of the Electoral College is explicitly written into the Constitution, it would take an amendment to change it. So how does this play out? Since every state except Maine and Nebraska have a winner-takes-all policy, whoever wins the popular vote in the state gets all of the electoral votes for the state, even if they barely win. It is possible to win the popular vote of the whole country but not win the presidency because of the ways that the electoral votes are cast. This happened in 2016 between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and in 2000 with Al Gore and George W. Bush, also a few times in the 1800s. This map shows which electors voted for each party in the past election, with red means Republican and blue means Democrat. And as you can see, Maine is split because they don't do winner takes all. A really important aspect of the Electoral College is the idea of swing states. So certain political parties are pretty much guaranteed to get the majority vote in certain states. Here is an example based on uh, past elections of how a map could look. Like I said before, blue means Democrat and red means Republican. The yellow states are what could be called swing states. Most, the most important ones are generally Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, since as you can see from this map, they have the most electoral votes. A Democratic candidate, for example, wouldn't campaign, campaign as hard in Massachusetts since they pretty much know they're going to get all those electoral votes. Instead, they would focus maybe on Pennsylvania because this battleground states, as it is sometimes called, are the most important ones to win to win the presidency since they could go to either candidate. This is why voters in certain states may have more influence over the outcome of an election. But that being said, it is still extremely important that everyone goes out and votes on election day. So overall, although the Electoral College is a complicated system and many people disagree with it, it has stood the test of time, since it inherently benefits those who are in power, and it would need a two-third majority vote in Congress to change it. Those in favor of it say that it gives a voice to people who don't live in areas with large cities, and all the interests of the American people are represented more equally.